to the Mike on Much podcast. I am your host, Mike Veerman, and I'm here with my friend and trusted producer, Max Kerman. Max, how's it going? I'm doing pretty good. Today on the show, we are talking to Margot Price. Yeah, she's uh, an amazing singer-songwriter from America. That's right. She's Americana kind of singer-songwriter. Well, it's a great segue because yeah. her latest album is called All American Made. And uh, she comes on to talk about uh, you know how she got to where she is and basically the normal conversation that we have. I sometimes think that... Um, our Kells, like, are too, as a band, like, we talk about too many different things. Like, I like Chance the Rapper. I like Bruce Springsteen. Sometimes I like this Pearl Jam song. I like this electronic. And, and I think it's maybe confusing for people, but when you're Margot Price and you're, like, an Americana singer-songwriter and your album's called All American, there's a focus to that, yeah, which I kind of admire, which we definitely don't have. Hey, man, you keep doing you. Thank you. Before we get to Margot Price, Max, what's been going on in your life, buddy? I feel well. First of all, we're recording this on a Thursday. Yeah, this will hopefully be out uh, by Friday for all the listeners uh, who tune in. There's been a lot going on. I feel like, and we'll get to that in a bit. I mean, social media. I feel like blew up in the last 48 it's hours. It's been a pretty um, delicious week of social media. Like it's like I'm just thirsty for it all the time. There's a lot of stuff to gobble up. <laughs> what's with? I don't know why we started talking in like food terms. <laughs> you got real excited. Delicious, I'm just gobbling it thirsty up. Thirsty and yeah. gobbling. Yeah. You had a weird g- glint in your I eye. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. But yeah, so I, we got a tweet from somebody saying, "Oh, disappointed to hear Max is leaving Hamilton." Because on a podcast, I said I was moving in with Lauren. That's right. Uh, to Toronto, which That's is true. Right. But I'm also holding on to my place in Hamilton. Uh, so basically, I'll be living that sort of Don Draper life where you have a place <laughs> in the city. Place <laughs> the, uh, the, my Hamilton place is um, sort of changing hands right now because I mentioned this on previous podcasts. Greg and Al, my roommates who I've lived with for the last four years, are moving out. They're moving in with their girlfriends. And now I have to sort of outfit the place and find new tenants because I've been renting to my friends. Where uh, you could be a slumlord. Where I can be a bit of a slumlord. (laughs) Exactly. And so our friend Psycho T, otherwise known as Taylor, who's kind of the young guy in our group who who isn't shacked up yet with somebody. He's still looking, ladies. He's still looking. He's moving in because I was like, hey, we got a spare room. Do you want to live? You know, the hood's great. Uh, you, you're familiar with the house. You've had many parties there. You know what the TV looks like. It's going to come relatively f- like fully furnished. <laughs> and he's like, okay, I'm in. Yeah. And then, uh, and I know, like, he knows what he's getting himself into with the house. Uh, I will say, though, I think he's a very clean person. <laughs> Not to say that Al and Greg aren't clean, <laughs> but they are typical guys and they just kind of don't give a fuck. Like, I, I could leave on tour. Yeah. And just as I'm, like, walking out the door, see a pizza flyer on the ground. Yeah. And then come back from tour a month later and that pizza flyer is still on the ground. Exact same spot. It's, it's just kind of, like, in the house is, like, a really nice old kind of classic Victorian house. But it is, uh, it sort of has all the signifiers of a frat house. Sure. You know, has a recliner like a blazy boy and it, it's ironic that the guy you're sort of feel more comfortable renting the place to is named psycho t <laughs> <laughs> i just feel like he's going to be a more reasonable uh tenant he's gonna be more reasonable tenant. and also so i haven't been home at all either not to say that i am any better like any of all the i've lived with basically all the champagne boys and they would all tell you that like i'm no angel myself when it comes to sort of like keeping house like I, also i don't have an eye for it i like i don't know what looks good like that's actually one of the nice things about living with lauren is that like the place looks amazing i've yeah. never lived in a place that looks so nice because she just has that touch now um and i haven't been home in a while so i get back to the place and the place is sort of in shambles because <laughs> the, you, i don't know maybe a month and a half ago you guys held shane's baby shower oh yeah yeah, yeah. so were, you were there for that right I sure was. i was away on tour in the uk so that was at least a month ago your place is in the same state that we left it after it's the a, diaper party basically yeah it wasn't a baby shower it was a diaper party Di- diaper party yeah, yeah yeah so uh there's still like on the wall like shaney boy 69 <laughs> written, but like missing some letters uh, the couch that was moved downstairs from al's room to have more seating is still there yeah the, the dining room table is now in the front of the house by the front window. <laughs> it just looks crazy. Yeah, that's what the pizza was on. Yeah, that's what the pizza was it's on. It's still like that. It's still there. The Man, pizza hasn't great. been removed, but <laughs> everything else has stayed. <laughs> Whatever. I, and here's the other thing. I kind of don't really care. No. But I did care on this specific day because uh, a friend of a friend, I know her a little bit, she is moving to Hamilton to take midwifery at McMaster and doesn't have a place to live in Hamilton. So I right. said, this is actually perfect. You can live in my place. You, are, she's twenty three. 
I, I really nice family. She's in a good program. You know, you, you can assume she'll, she'll be pay a, her bills. She won't shit on the floor. Yeah, and she'll be a better tenant than Greg and Al by far. Sure. Who Probably. never paid their bills and constantly shit on the yeah, floor. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. At least one of the two. No, I'm kidding. They're, they're good. <laughs> yeah. So at around 11 o'clock, Psycho moves in. Now, you know, now, for context, Greg hasn't moved any of his stuff out yet, and Al's still living there. Right. Greg's in Ireland. And Greg's in Ireland, and he's, he's planning to move his stuff out in the next day or two. Not that I'm my brother's defender yeah. or keeper, but... Facts, Max. Yeah, and, and I knew that there was, there was going to be some overlap. So Psycho moves this whole single guy apartment into the house, but there's no room to put anything because, first of all, the house is... What did you bring, like a mattress and an acoustic no, guitar? unlike your brother who just basically has a laptop and some t-shirts uh, <laughs> to his name, Psycho T has a couch and has a TV and just has stuff that anybody who's living by themselves would have. Sure. So all that stuff gets moved into the house and there's nowhere to put it. So it's in the living room right now. Just like this is piled up. Wow. And then, and there's six guys, uh, all champagne boys that are helping with the move. So anyway, I, I was thinking, I was like, oh man, this, like this house has gone from like bad to worse right now because Maddie is coming down to check out the house for the first time. Oh shit. So Maddie pulls up Julian's shirtless, like sitting on the stoop outside, like on the stairs. <laughs> with no shirt. So, so basically, Maddie and her brother, who <sighs> could not be sweeter people, pull up to the house, and there's just basically like five shirtless dudes kind of like laughing like the house is in shambles i haven't <laughs> touched the front yard like there's just weeds everywhere and it just like couldn't be a worse look and it was funny like she was walking around the house and she was like oh this is not like you know she's doing the thing you were the pleasantries thing where you have to say oh this is not you walk into every yeah, room yeah. and you go and if you're a polite person you go oh but there's no way she could possibly think what she was looking at was nice. No. So after like the second time, I'm like, listen, this place looks like shit right now. <laughs> and stop saying, oh, just like, just imagine it clean and don't say anything. So I think I haven't heard back from her yet. But, well, yeah, good luck with that. But well. I hope, uh, I hope she moves in. Is this your final plea to if she maybe listens to the pod? Yeah, I hope so. I know her friend does. So, uh, you know, we're going to get that place looking amazing and your new roommate is going to be very clean. Okay. And I'll be there some of the time too. So, uh, I'll, is that like a selling point you think? Probably not. Our Kel's front man will be there 20% of the time. <laughs> yeah, in the attic, uh, which is true. <laughs> um, so that happened. And then another funny thing that kind of happened that day is that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know the thing. What a life. So the way these moving days typically work, and there's like 15 champagne boys, and we all help each other move. That's sort of the deal. Yeah, you throw it in the champagne boys message group, and dudes show up. And dudes show up. This has happened multiple times, as we've all moved over the last decade. And the arrangement is, it's pretty simple. It's not that much work, and the more guys there are, the less work there is for each person. You show up, you move a couple things and then you're drinking beer and pizza and eating pizza by like noon basically yeah. like it's really not that hard of a day uh, and the hang is great just as we're finishing moving taylor out jug has made some murmurs about having to bore the truck the moving truck to do something for his house so i was like okay and they said okay i need a few guys uh, to go to lowe's with me and they were like and, then, and Nick is there and Nick is like the ultimate team player. Nick's like, okay, I can go. And Psycho T is there and Psycho T and Jug are brother-in-laws. Yeah. So Psycho T is like, okay, I can help. And then Jug says, I have to go to Lowe's because I'm building a deck and I have to pick up a thousand pounds worth of cinder blocks and wood. And he just, and, and we're all kind of like looking at each other like, did he just really say that? It's like, incredible oh my goodness you look shocked right now. i am yeah so lucky for well he should have probably said that before people volunteered well this is it i mean and then but he kind of got you in a corner there oh yeah sneaky sneaky uh, jug and jug probably is listening to this going that motherfucker every time he needs anything built i come over and build it for him like honestly <laughs> if i get an ikea anything i call jug he's the guy i call sure. and Jug comes over and sweats it out for three hours and builds whatever i need so jug is a very helpful person but Building a deck is a whole other thing. And those guys, uh, they can only fit three in the truck. So oh, only shit. the three of them went. And they took three hours because they went to Lowe's on a Saturday. And Lowe's on a Saturday, as you know, in, in the springtime or in the summer is a nightmare. Because everybody's My building goodness. stuff. So anyway, I had a great afternoon. Me, <laughs> Sean, and Julian, and Al just watched the soccer game and ate pizza. I saw you later that night. Yeah. Uh, because we were watching Warriors and Houston. In, in our Felix's backyard. Felix's backyard. He projected it. So everyone got together to watch basketball in the evening with projection in the backyard. And I knew you guys had moved, which I had uh, sort of strategically avoided. <laughs> I'm not like a guy that lifts a lot of stuff well. I lifted nothing. Uh, <laughs> I know. I've seen you on previous moves. Yeah. Um, and, but I showed up like, you know, whatever time it would have been around eight. 
and you were already like just kind of beaming and slurry and i yeah. was like oh man these guys have been having- well, well we had a great day but uh, psycho jug and nick they had a much tougher day yeah tough for those guys and i texted julian the next day because julian for some reason offered to help build the deck with jug i texted him, i was like i can't i still can't believe you're building that that deck and he said that makes two of us so <laughs> we'll, we'll see what the deck looks like but you know as we get older and where we have these houses and you have to sort of take care of the houses like i will do pay any amount of money not to participate in building or decorating or doing any housework. Sure. But that's a nice luxury to have. I know. So it just makes me think I got to make some more money. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can avoid these manual yeah. labor. Like, I'll do tasks. anything not to do that. Stuff. Yeah. But hey, what's going on with you? What's uh, It's been a, it's been a, a fun week in the world outside of the champagne boys. Uh, not much. What's been going on? I mean, lots been going on. I've been seeing, you know, the, the, the champagne boys plenty. I was in on the weekend, obviously, yeah. although I didn't help move. Um, actually, I wanted to mention to you from last week's episode, you know, people were shocked that you spent over $2,000 on your phone bill in Europe. Oh yeah. I had a call with Bell yesterday. Well, my friend Jimmy reached out, who listens to every pod, and he's like, tell Max. What did he say? He just needs to, when he goes to Europe, get a SIM card there. I know. This is the move, apparently. I know. I'm no tech expert, but he said that's what him and his wife do, and easy peasy. Yeah, so. How do you not know this? I know. I did know that, but then I was thinking that the $12 a day, I was willing to pay that, the Rome Like Home package, but then I went way over in data usage, uh. and so I, the guy called me yesterday, he he took it down 50%. So from like $1,700, so divide in half, which is like 850. Yeah. And then he got rid of the long distance charges, which were like $280. Nice. So, I, so I've saved like about $1,000 already from the 2500 but it's still, I'm like sitting at like twelve or $1,300. What was the justification for cutting it down? He just said, I can do this for you. And then I said, how about 75%? He's like, I can't do that for you. <laughs> Did you threaten to change carriers? I haven't got there yet. So anyway, he made me the offer and I said, I'm got there yet. Uh, he said, I'm going to have to, th- I said, I have to think about this. You call me back tomorrow. So well, we're in the middle of the negotiation, guys. Oh, there's Art a of the deal. We'll figure out how this ends yeah. next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but a lot's going on. I was out, uh, so our softball uh, has started up, our yeah. softball team, the Gamblers. Yeah. And uh, on Tuesday night, uh, we had a game. And Dan Hamilton and I uh, ended up going out for some drinks after the game. And this was a weird day because basically that Tuesday started with news that Roseanne had tweeted a racist tweet comparing one of Obama's advisors uh, to to Planet Apes. Yeah, right. So huge backlash online. Uh, I actually, while I was in Justin Stockman's office, who's the guy that makes this pod happen, Mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking about pod stuff, he literally, like, I was like, man, this Roseanne stuff's crazy. Like, how are, like, Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman going to go back to this show now? And he goes, well, it's canceled. And I went, what? And he, like, pointed, and his TV was on, uh, like, CP2 for and had the big red, like, scrolling ticker. It's like, Roseanne canceled. I'm like, wow. I'm like, so this has been canceled by three, even though it was the biggest show on ABC last season by far. I'm like, that's a huge move, uh, the right move. Um... But I was just, I couldn't believe they did it. Because usually when there's a lot of money at stake, we know what wins. Yeah. So then I go and I play softball. So we're, I'm not looking at my phone. Nothing's really happening. Uh, Dan Hamilton and I go for drinks afterward. And while we're sitting there, the nut starts blowing up, I guess, a chat group with you and Dan about Pusha T mm-hmm. releasing this, uh, the diss track that was a response to Drake's last diss track, which was a response to Pusha T's initial diss track yeah. uh, produced by Kanye. I hope you guys are still with me. And by the way, I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't already know. Yeah. And I'm not really, like, I don't follow like rap beef or whatever, but I'm, I'm like, super into this rap. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, okay, what, like what makes this push a teeth things? And you know, the nut is using all the hyperbole in the world, which actually wasn't <laughs> even hyperbole in this case, I guess yeah. he was like, he's gone nuclear. This is that, <laughs> you know? And so I'm like, okay, now I got to read the lyrics. I read the lyrics. He's talking about Drake's illegitimate love child that he's denied that he had with a, I guess, a pornographic actress. Uh, and you know, he hits Dennis Graham, your boy. Yeah. Drake's dad. Drake's friend dad. Of mine. Uh, he hits, uh, what is it? 40, 40, which is the most malicious one of all of them. Honestly. And just flat out mean too far. Like, like the other stuff, you know, maybe it's in the, the realm of rap battles. Making some fun of somebody for having MS. I know. That's insane. Well, here's the thing. It's like, if you think, you know, uh, Dennis Graham is ridiculous. And a bad dad. Okay, fine. Whatever. If, if Drake has fathered a child that he's been ignoring or he's been keeping secret, fine. Whatever. I mean, it's gossip, it's dirt, whatever. Fine. But a guy that literally gets MS through no fault of his own, yeah. to hit that, it's just like, ugh. Oh, yeah. But Pusha T's crazy. Twitter was just on fire, I think, like through this whole... 
Well, this is the thing. Episode. This is why Twitter is such an effective drug. Yeah. Something happens and we get that shot, right? And then we just want to take all of the little pieces that come with it. What's this person saying? What's this person saying? Is this person responded? And you're just scrolling through your fucking Twitter feed I know. for the next hour. And there's, no, and there's a lot of comedy in there. It's like of someone, course. someone tweeted, it's like, that push a T stock I've been holding since 2001 is really coming up big right now because no one's really been thinking about push a T in probably 15 <laughs> years. And somebody also tweeted, it's like, a, a rap beef is literally two grown adults writing poems about each other. Which that was also that was funny. funny. Yeah. There was this funny meme where this guy was like, uh, I wasn't actually interested in this Pusha T Drake rap beef, but now, and then it's a guy just like flexing open a lawn chair and then sitting down. <laughs> but it was really funny. Another good one with, because uh, Drake's been accused of using ghostwriters. Yeah. Is that like after the Pusha T, the second Pusha T, Pusha T diss, uh, there was a meme of like army cadets jumping out of a plane and it's like Drake calling in his ghostwriters. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's pretty, pretty funny. Yeah. Anyway, just as we're sort of like, you know, having a conversation about this, Dan and I going through Twitter to look at this Drake shit as we're sitting at the pub having a drink, Bill Simmons tweets, and it's a ringer piece about the president and GM of the Philadelphia 76ers, Brian Colangelo. Now, for those of you that don't follow basketball, uh, this guy, Brian Colangelo, used to be the president and GM of the Toronto Raptors. So, like, we've spent years with this guy. Yeah. It turns out, and this is the story, he has five... Twitter burner accounts allegedly allegedly that he uses to critique the players on his team players in the league the media the media who disagree with his takes he uses it to pump up his stock this is the allegation yeah. and criticize former GM of the 76ers that's right Sam Hankey who was his predecessor in Philadelphia it's like a, it was this well researched story that was like it's pretty compelling and it would be shocked like and you I don't mean, even need to be a basketball fan like it's more it's more fun if you're a basketball fan because you know who the characters are but just the idea of somebody who who runs a big company who's powerful who's really powerful and, and respected and known as sort of a serious guy has made up five different Twitter accounts uh, to send to, petty tweets and defend himself yeah is is pretty fascinating and sensitive team information about guys failing physicals anyway it was read it if you haven't read it it's compelling but of course before we could even like process the Drake stuff we were reading the Colangelo stuff and two hours earlier Rosanna just been canceled and I was just I got home from drinks and Danica was like are you coming to bed and I was like, no, I'm just going to lay on the couch and read Twitter yeah. for the next hour. It was crazy, yeah, because my friend Matt Fruckman, uh, who's interested in all the same stuff, yeah. he called me, like, we had to talk about it. It was really, like, exciting. He, like, yeah, he called me at, like, 1130, and we yelled at each other for, like, half an hour. Also, I like how it all kind of intersected between the Drake stuff and the Colangelo stuff, because one of the central characters in the Colangelo story is Joel Embiid, who's the star center for the 76ers. And uh, he tweeted... I'm up like a, as this was all coming out. He tweeted, "I'm upset at Drake because Drake has a new, a brand new song that came out on the weekend called i 'I'm Upset.' Yeah. But he's using that to reference the situation he's going through. Uh, <laughs> and Drake is also in the midst of this other battle. And and Pusha T made fun of the 'I'm Upset' line. Like the culture moves so fucking fast, it's crazy. And that's the other thing about hip hop is that like Pusha T put a song out on Monday that was resp and that it referenced a song that Drake had put out on Saturday. Yeah, and Drake's original diss track was referencing a Pusha T song that had come out like three days before. It's like, moving quick. It moves so quickly. Here's a question for you, and this is maybe human nature because we were doing this long before the internet, but why en masse and as a society do we enjoy social embarrassment so much? Why do we like seeing figures just be socially embarrassed? Is it because it makes us feel better about our flaws? Do we like to see people get taken down? Like, why are we eating it up? I think it's... Um, I don't know if I... I think a lot of people w w do have compassion for the, the the people who are going through like weird and uncomfortable situations. Like, I even w as weird as it sounds, like think I'm like, man, I would hate to be Brian Colangelo right now. Like, I can just like nightmare. I feel for that guy, even if he did it. And I he, know. And there's there's no excuse for it. But I'm still like, oh man, like this is tough. But that said. Everyone just likes a salacious story. It's like that's why we watch television shows. That's why like people even read the news because people just like l the narrative of life is a, is is a fascinating thing, and that's just like people like to gobble it up. Why do I listen to podcasts? Why do I you know do any like consume any kind of media? because like the narrative around things is always interesting. Do you think Drake has an illegitimate love child with the French porn star? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Yeah, I don't wish uh, this really on anybody. But you'll consume it. But I will consume it. And we all do. Yeah. 
Max, we got to get to Margot Price. Let's get to her. She was cool, man. She was a cool hang. We get it because she's played SNL. Obviously, she was on uh, Jack White's uh, Third Man label. Yeah, and she struggled, man. Like she, like she has stories about like having to sell like her her car just to finance the record, and then her and her husband moving back in with the folks. She kind of takes us on the journey from really sort of like chasing your dream to actually starting to see success to then all of a sudden sort of exploding and then she's playing SNL and Russell Crowe is hosting. Yeah, and she's like kind of like rough around the edges in a charming kind of way, would you say? There's an honesty. Yeah. For sure. Which I kind of like. I always find that kind of refreshing because sometimes when you hear about these people that are really successful and even though they they come off as maybe rough around the edges or, ha- you know, but you're just like, oh, actually that guy only drinks protein shakes and works out three times a day. Yeah. And, and sort of like is a hyper-focused person. And so when you hear people that are like, no, they're like, they have a skill, but they're more human or something and more like For the sure. rest of us. I always love that. Her album's called All American Made. Go get it. See her when she's on the road. Good conversation. But before we get to her, Maxie, we've had a big spike. This yeah. has been the biggest month ever for our podcast. Yeah, we got a really encouraging email from uh, Web- Webby D. Yeah. Uh, saying that the downloads are up. So keep telling your friends. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for downloading the show and subscribing to the show and spreading the gospel. And if you're just a Margot Price fan tuning in for the first time, please go find us. We are on Google Play, Stitcher, the iHeartRadio app, of course, YouTube, uh, and iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. So check us out. Maxi, do you want to get to Margot Price? Let's get to it. Check, check. Morning voice. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, you just played Danforth last night. Yes, we did. How was it? Oh, it was amazing. It yeah. was a really good time, yeah. Good crowd? Great crowd. Toronto crowds. Sometimes they can be stiff, but were they, were they having Oh, it? man, no. They were attentive when they needed to be attentive, and they were rowdy when, when we were, and yeah, we partied. It was fun. <laughs> nice. And then you leave for uh, Waterloo, New York tomorrow, right? I guess so, yeah. When you're on a tour... Like, Actually, tonight. Tonight you have to head out. Yeah. When you're... Yeah in it are you very conscious of which cities you're going to or is it just kind of like tell me where i'm going and point the way i usually know like just the next day i just kind of take it one day at a time yeah (laughs) (laughs) i can't handle any more than that it yeah i imagine it becomes overwhelming people are like oh on the 17th they're gonna be in you know this this i'm like i don't know i just know (laughs) tomorrow (laughs) yeah yeah exactly i didn't even know waterloo is tomorrow so Thank you. <laughs> hey, my pleasure. I'm, I, I love to give information. Um, do you enjoy the road? I do. Yeah, I really enjoy meeting new people and and being in different places. I've I've always had a little bit of a rambling fever. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I was in a band and we did a bunch of touring. And when, you know, when I started making music when I was like a teenager, the dream is to oh man, get on the road with my friends and get out there and do the damn thing. But then I, I found the reality of it was like after the initial sort of excitement was, man, this is like, this is a grind. It can be really, it can be really grueling for sure. I mean, it's about, you know, 5% of your day is actually spent playing music. The thing that you're out there to do yeah. that you love. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of airports and I don't really enjoy airports. I don't really enjoy border crossings, but I do enjoy, you know, going to different restaurants and checking out you know different landmarks if you if you have time if you can squeeze it in then you know just try to make the best out of out of it um we've definitely had you know some nightmare weather on this trip especially i feel like this whole entire tour we've been touring since january and it's just like a storm cloud is following us around yeah, yeah snowing on us everywhere yeah. raining and um i haven't seen the sun in like seven or eight days i think <laughs> <laughs> um so i want to go back a bit you live in uh nashville now but you were born in illinois yep what kind of town uh was alito is that how you say it? alito alito yeah alito, yeah yeah it was uh well it, it was and still is um just a, a little speck in middle america and uh it's a farming community and there's it's a, a lot of it is, you know, based around the football team and uh, <laughs> those, you know, Friday nights and, um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot to do. So growing up, I just really, um, I, 
tried to stay out of trouble, you know, try to get good grades, but it can be a little boring. So you, you look for find a little bit of trouble. Yeah. You look for things to do <laughs> <laughs> to pass the time. Did you subscribe to the sort of the culture? Like, like you said, like everyone's about the football team and kind of that whole scene. Did you, did you fall into that or did you feel like a bit other or outside? Well, I fell into it, but I always, you know, knew that there was something else out there that I wanted to find. And, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I was a, I was a high school cheerleader. I wow. sang the national anthems at the basketball and football games. Um, that's so a part of the culture or the, I guess, the very, American it very experience. much is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, I've, I definitely rebelled in my own ways. Um, my parents kept a pretty short leash on me. I was the first of three girls. And um, so, yeah, they, you know, they definitely were very overprotective and, you know, sneaking out and uh, to writing your own notes to, to you know, Oh, forging cut school. Like notes to yeah, school. <laughs> yeah. Those things definitely happen. I definitely had some in school suspensions, and um, I did not have a perfectly clean record. <laughs> right, right. How, so, how do you find music then? I mean, is, do you, do, was it a musical household? Are there instruments around the house? Yeah, my parents um, bought me a piano when cool. I was. Um, probably seven or eight years old. Was that like an initiative you started? Like, I want to learn the piano or were they like, let's buy a piano and maybe the, the kids will get into it. I think it. it was a combination. I mean, you know, they were like, do you want a piano? I was like, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, I, I was always, um, singing and making up songs. I mean, before I had the piano, I had a little, um, karaoke like tape recorder where I could, you know, put reverb on and record my own voice. And, um, make up songs and I was always writing poems and, and journaling and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, music, it was always kind of around. I mean, the radio was always on, yeah. you know, and sang in church choir. And like I said, at the, you know, basketball games and stuff like that. And I sang in choir in school and it was a good, it was a good escape from, the nothingness sure, sure. <laughs> from the nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, as you start to kind of shift into, was there a moment where you're like, you know what, this is actually what I want to do with my life and how am I going to accomplish that? Or were you just making music and whatever happened, happened? I remember telling my, um, my little sister, she was three years younger than me. I remember her telling her when we were driving in the car one day, I couldn't have been more than, I don't know, maybe seven or eight or something. And, I said, if there wasn't music, I think I would just die. I just wouldn't even want to live. And I remember her telling my mom, Margot said she wants to die if there, <laughs> if there wasn't music. Um, so, I, you know, I, it moved me from a very early age. But, um, and like I said, I, you know, I was always, I was writing songs very young, but I think like junior high, high school, when they start doing those like aptitude tests for like what your career should be. Where they're going to funnel you into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At that point I was like, well, I want to be an actress or, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be on the stage Yeah. and I didn't know how I was going to accomplish it. But most of the teachers were not very encouraging. They're like, well, you know, that's cute. That's a nice dream. Right. But that's, it's not practical. And it really hurt my feelings and it, you know, it really, um, it set me back, you know, when you've got like the school guidance counselor telling you like not to pursue your dreams, it's, it's, uh, something that no, that nobody should do to, to young kids. You know, you should be able to explore many avenues of, or any avenue of, of what you want to do, but so how do you push through that then? So you say it sets you back. At what point do you then sort of regather the sort of fortitude to press forward with, fuck this, like I'm, I am going to either be an actress or a singer or I'm going to get on that stage? Well, my, my mom was always very encouraging and I was in dance lessons and she took me to voice lessons. She would drive me like 40 minutes away up into the cities Yeah, yeah and okay. we would go to this, this woman who gave me voice lessons and, um, but I think 
I've always been the kind of person, the, always the kind of personality type that is like, if you tell me I can't do something, then that's going to make me want to prove myself like tenfold. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that that definitely kind of maybe even, even put a chip on my shoulder to 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 go forth and, and prove people wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a time along the way, and we ask a lot of artists this, um, you know, where you thought, I don't know if this is, like, this is, it's such an unconventional career to be a successful musician. Um, was there ever a point where you were like, I don't, I don't know if this is going to happen and maybe I should pursue something else? Oh, totally. Yeah. Many, many times. Um, yeah, at one point we, my husband and I sold almost all of our music gear. We, um you know, on Craigslist and at a yard sale, we made like $4,000 and my dad came back to Nashville with a flatbed trailer and we threw all my stuff on there just like we did moving it in, you know, looking like the Be Beverly Hillbillies <laughs> <laughs> pile of junk all strapped down with bungee cords. Yeah. And we moved back in with my parents and, um, you know, it was, uh, it was humbling in so many ways. Um, it was, but it was, it was sad, you know, cause of I course. didn't want to give up. Um, and then after I, um, got pregnant and everything was, was happening. I wasn't, um, I wasn't in a, a good mental state and I decided that I wasn't, I didn't want to do music anymore for a while. And I bought this, um, this really nice camera and I decided I wanted to be a photographer <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I still have the camera, but I don't take as many pictures as, no. as a real photographer, but I don't have quite the eye for it. I have all these Polaroid cameras and, um, and digital cameras and, all, but I knew that that wasn't my place either. So what changed then? You know, you're at this point where you're struggling a bit. You decide not to do music. You grab, you buy a, a camera. What changes in that time where you go, I'm going to start pursuing this again? You know, it's like, I don't even remember like a catalyst, but it's like there's the guitar is still sitting there in the room just and you just me. pick it up yeah. and you just keep writing because there's like, there's something, you know, in you that's like, write the song. You have a good idea. Just write the song. And, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about art is that, you know, you just do it and you make it because you love it. And it's like when it's not about success, like that is when art is the most pure. And um, so, yeah, it just always the, the damn guitar just always kept ending up in my hands. And, you know, we we moved away so many times and we said we were done with it so many times and it's like a love affair that you just can't quit. It won't stop. <laughs> yeah. Is there a specific moment where you felt like, oh, things are happening in a tangible way? And meaning like, oh, like, okay, this is different than it was before. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of those little moments. And I, I feel like that is what kept me hanging on for, you know, 12, 13 years before things actually started to turn. Right. It would be like, a glimmer of hope with like an indie label or like yeah. doing a podcast or like, you know, getting a little write up in the local paper or something like, or like, you know, this manager comes along and he's like, I'm going to help you. You've got real talent or, you know, a um, kind of like, like false starts or indicators of right, success. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, Kenny Vaughn who plays with Marty Stewart and he's, but you know, played with everybody. Um, he came to one of our shows in Nashville and there was like, there was nobody there, you know, it was like maybe anywhere from, I don't know, maybe, maybe 50 to 70 people. Not, not the most depressing show I've ever had, right. but <laughs> oh, depressing I, I, nonetheless, you know, I've done a couple of those. Like there's like five people there, oh, totally. your friends or your family. Yeah. And it's just yeah. Like, hey, because it's your birthday. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Came out of the show. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it, like I remember one night I got off stage and I was just like, yeah, fuck this shit, you know, why am I doing this? And then Kenny Vaughn walked up and he was like, whatever it is, you've got it. Like, don't stop. 
And like, I could just hear, I'm just thinking about that. Cause it like, it bought me like three more months, you know, yeah. like, just like, okay, like I got, I can do this. Um, and then, but I really think the catalyst was when uh, my rock and roll band kind of started dying and, you know, we'd been, we had this like really great indie label that was going to put out a record and then, and then they merged with another, um, with some, you know, kind of money making, um, independent people and, and they didn't want to sign us. And so we were really down in the, in the ditch. And then I, um, I went out to just, I was like, you know, I'm just going to go play some country songs. We kind of formed this band just for fun, just to do it for fun and just to play one show and then kind of be done with it. And, um, and then things started, people really started enjoying it. And so, you know, more people would ask me to play with my country band than with the rock and roll band. And I kept showing up and and doing it and more people were coming and there was a good buzz going. And then, um, Rolling Stone country had just set up in Nashville and like the main editor was there and he was like, Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Like, where'd you come from? Like you're making real country music in Nashville. This is so crazy. (laughs) It was probably like, you know, maybe even four years ago. And, uh, then when, once we got this like write up in Rolling Stone, I really had the fire in me because they were like, send me your record. And I said, well, we haven't recorded one yet. <laughs> and then, yeah, then the whole, well, we got to record a record. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then a couple of years later, still. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but that seemed to me to be like a catalyst and it wasn't even Rolling Stone in print. It was just online. Yeah. But so many, so many people were really proud of me, people from my hometown and you know, it, it seemed like a, a good a good jumping off point. How does it, cause I know, um, your first two records were put out on third man. How does Jack white become involved? Well, it could have been that Rolling Stone write up. Um, right. We had, we made a music video before we did the album. It was a music video that took place in a very dodgy motel room on Gallatin road. And, um, it was for the song since you put me down. And, um, when and then Rolling Stone wrote that up, it was like, you know, anything we were doing, they were like bringing attention to it. And it said, uh, like Jack White produced, uh, country music, you know, like they were comparing it to, uh, Oh, like stuff. The the Loretta album that he did. Gotcha. And so I was like, well, maybe that put us on his radar. Um, but yeah, I just, I heard through my pedal steel player that, that they wanted to hear the record. And at this point I had sent, we had made the record. My husband sold our car to finance it. Wow. Upon my wedding ring, we sold um, a reel-to-reel machine. We sold all these amazing, like, tube microphones and like, all, everything. Just to raise just, the money yeah, just, to make this record. Yeah, we went all in. Yeah. And, um, and we sent it out to everyone in town and everyone out of town. I mean, we sent it to labels in New York. We sent it to labels in Georgia. We sent it to labels in the UK. It was just like, if anyone will put it out, we don't care. We just we just wanted to get it out there. And um, I mean, these rejections were like hitting so hard. Mm. Like going out and getting like plastered, like after reading a rejection letter, like. Would the rejection letters be like specific? Some, yeah, some of them were like, um, oh, there's a couple I remember that I always reference. One of them was, um, oh, we really like Margot, but we already have two girls on our label. <sighs> um, oh yes, we're, another one was, oh yes, we're aware of who Margot is and we're not interested. And it was like, well, did you listen to the record? Like a lot of these people, I don't even think we're listening to the record. Mm. Um, then the ones that would, they would say, you know, do you have anything like, can we take the pedal steel off? Can we change it? Can we make it more rock? Can we make it more soul? Can we make it more pop? I was yeah, like, no, I already we- did a rock and roll record. That's not working for me. This is what I'm doing now. And so, yeah, it was just like rejection after rejection. And then, but I, I never sent it out to third man. And I just didn't, didn't think they would be interested in putting out a a full length record. I mean, they did a lot of singles, but they didn't do, you know, album deals at that point for artists. So is he specifically involved in sort of the, the recruiting or the, the working relationship or like, we want you on the label. They, so, you know, the name is third man and it's Jack white, Ben Swank and Ben Blackwell. And the three of them, they all vote on what comes in, you know? So 
two out of three is you know what you that's need a pass. to pass a vote. Yep. Yeah, you and you know that's they. I'm sure it's happened all different ways for them. You know, things get rejected. Things, you know, sometimes two people like it. Sometimes all three. And um, I think, I think I might have been the first ones that got an all three unanimous mm. vote from Jack and Blackwell and Ben Swank. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, they turned everything around in such a huge way. It was, it was crazy how all of a sudden I had like street cred and I was cool and it was like f- that, you know, yeah, which is yeah. insane. It's yeah. It's the, it's the funny, the funny thing about success is that like people that never wanted to talk to you before never gave you the time of the day all of a sudden they want to be your best friends and then people not everyone but some people that were your best friends like they hate you suddenly or you know there's like jealousy and there's uh it just complicates things but um yeah once once they came on board then you know there was kind of a waiting period of like getting the contract ready and and actually like making everything happen that seemed like another three to six months of course sit around and hurry up and wait and and then like not tell anybody and nashville despite growing at an extremely fast rate is a small town and so you know i was trying to keep it secret and one person tells another person and pretty soon i'm at a gas station i hear you're gonna sign with third man records yeah 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 walking in the kroger grocery store and they're like I heard a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Is this true? Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned Rolling Stone, and I read the, the the big piece on you in the print, which was a great piece. Were you happy with that? Yeah, I was. Yeah, it was good. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I want to bring up is you've been like. Um, you're not shy about sharing your political opinion, you know, which I think actually can be unique in your genre. Yeah, uh, definitely <laughs> unique. <laughs> um, and I guess, I guess, I'm curious, like. Where does that come from? Are your parents political? Are they? Are have you always been someone that's fascinated by those things, or is it just a, a function of the times? Meaning, like we're in such a sort of what feels like a polarizing political time. Now, I I definitely was raised to not talk politics. Yeah, um, especially with your friends and your family, <laughs> people you love, because it will cause arguments, and never to tell anyone who you're voting for. You know that is your vote. You don't have to share it with anybody, and. Well, I totally, there's still a part of me that, you know, feels that way. Um, I think a lot of it is the climate and, you know, this election was unlike any other (laughs) in American history um, and continues to be. But um, I also equate it to my American history and sociology teacher, Mr. Archer in my high school. And he was one of the only good teachers that really was passionate about what he did and he he wrote his own tests and he taught the real version of american history he didn't teach it by the book you know he he told you the truth and um and he you know he he taught us that ignorance is bliss and you know that if you're not paying attention like you're fucked yeah (laughs) because And, you know, look where we're at now. Um, So I think, you know, he had a lot to do with it. And in his class, I I loved arguing with people. I loved playing the devil's advocate, you know, like... Just the debate. Right, just the debate. I love talking about things and I love... If you don't don't talk about things, then they'll never change. So at the risk of, um, you know, alienating fans or or whatever, I'm just going to go ahead and speak my mind and then... And get them out of the way so they don't come to my show and boo me live. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was going to be my question. Have you seen or felt backlash, like in, I guess, particularly the red states, like about being sharing your opinions openly? No, not really. I mean, I, I think that people don't want to spend money on a ticket to, you know, to go out and see somebody that they don't agree with. That's of like, course, right. That's, you know, how they're getting, and that is their, you know, their freedom and and that is what makes america great and beautiful is that we all have choices still (laughs) at this point (laughs) yeah but uh yeah i've had a surprising low amount of hecklers i think one show um and it was more midwest or or up north i'm trying to think of where it was but it was on this run maybe it was indianapolis i said something about i was singing reagan was selling weapons to the leaders of iran and somebody goes no he wasn't and then i 
I said, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was that, you know. They, yeah. I don't, they weren't like, I'm leaving. This is bullshit. Right. They just uh, disagreed with it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm stayed. like, that's fine. But uh, I had one other guy. Um, since this album cycle has been out, I sang Pay Gap when I was in Ireland and uh, doing this like festival and and uh, I got done and I was like, some guy said, I hope your next song's better than your last. And I, I told him where to shove it. I said some very choice words for that man. <laughs> <laughs> um, you played SNL, which is, you know, a, a pretty culturally significant thing. Were you, this was in 2016, Russell Crowe was the host. Yes. Did you hang with Russ a little? Yes. <laughs> How is he? He's a musician He's too. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Did he have a good time? Yeah, he had a good time. We were, uh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant we went to for the after party, but. Um, Did you fully commit to the after party? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Very much so. We had a great time. Uh, it was the first time I had like paparazzi like following me around and taking photos and like getting out of the car. It was very weird. But uh, yeah, we got up into this really fancy restaurant. We had a sit down dinner and everything, and then, and then after the dinner, everybody kind of starts moving around and talking and you know, mingling. And um, Russell was like, "Come sit at my table." So I went over, and you know, we didn't talk much the week because you know we were both working so much. Just hello, and you know, exchange some, uh, you know, a couple a couple words here and there. But um, yeah, at the after party, we. Uh, we were smoking cigarettes inside and, um, you yeah, know, no one else was allowed to smoke except for me and Russell. That was it. And my whole band was like trying, you know, they were lighting up and the waiters would come over. No, not you guys, just you two. Getting very smoky in there. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Are you, or were you an SNL fan growing up? Like was, did you feel oh, yeah. the weight of getting this gig? Uh, totally. I mean, I, but like I said, I always wanted to be an actress. Of course. And I like, and comedy was what I did. I would like at family, you know, Christmases, I would get up and do like, you know, do stand up and yeah, make, like make fun of everyone. Character. Yeah. I like put on my <laughs> grandma's clothes. Room. Exactly. Yeah, 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 you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. talk about my uncle who drinks too much. And like, it was a whole thing. <laughs> so when I was on there, like I really wanted to do a skit and I didn't. I didn't get the opportunity to did do you, one. Did you put in the, the ask? They though? talked about it. No, I didn't ask. But they said later that they were going to do like a, a Johnny Cash, like June Carter. And I wish that I would have pushed it. They were like, "Oh, we thought you would have been nervous." Meanwhile, I had you know went to college and, and studied theater for a, only a year. But I, you know, it's enough to get into a. Skit. I feel like yeah, yeah. I could have handled it. But <laughs> I grew up in the um, the heyday of like Will Ferrell and Molly Shannon. Yeah. And Sherry O'Terry, like, I loved SNL. And we would, um, even at our high school pep rallies, and I told Lorne Michaels this, you know, I was like, we reenacted, like, the Spartan skits yep. and, like, several other SNL SNL skits. And he, I sat by, by Lorne for a long time and talked to him, too. And he was like, so I always like to know, like, what era you got into it at, you know, and, like, you know. He wants yeah. to know who your uh, who your cast was, right? That's exactly. What he likes to know. Your yeah. like your school. Yeah. Was there anything that like about the way the show works? Were you like, oh shit, that's kind of interesting? I don't know. Like, did you kind of just hang out and try to watch how they put the show together, or were you just focused on your set? No, you're there like all week. So we get there. We got there on Tuesday, and then you become like very familiar with it, and which is why if I wasn't really nervous, is because you we'd done it like every day since Tuesday. It right. Was, like, yeah, this is this is nothing. Yeah, but uh, it seemed a lot smaller than it looks on TV. Sure, it was smaller than I imagined. The backstage area was so cool, where everybody was like in this long hallway, like getting their makeup done, and all their chairs were right next to each other. It wasn't like everybody has their own dressing room. Like I had my own dressing room, and Russell had his own dressing room. But the cast, like they just lined up. They're just of, sitting yeah. out there, and you're just <laughs> seeing them like transform, you know, in between everything. And um, I made really good friends with the photographer there. Her name's Mary Ellen Matthews, and um, I hope to shoot with her in the future on some stuff. We've been talking about um, working together more. But every time I go to New York, like I hang out with her. That's cool. We go to this place called Eleventh Street uh, Pub and and shoot the shit. Um, but yeah, it's. It was, 
it was surreal. I mean, I was pinching myself the whole time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you for really having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, safe travels. We'll try. <laughs> Welcome to The Dessert. We are joined again on the phone from Hamilton, Ontario with his young and beautiful family, our pop culture aficionado, Shane Christian Cunningham. Shane, what's going on? Yo, yo. I'm not sure if you guys have been on social media uh, lately, but I've been <laughs> up at uh, JR Diggs, my buddy JR Diggs, who actually gave me my start in television. I'm I was up at his lodge called Long Point Lodge oh. for a little bit. Did you guys see that? No, the, the reason we laughed when you said, I don't know if you guys have been on social media, is the whole opening is essentially about how social media exploded in the last 48 hours. Oh, how? Oh, just with, you know, the, the Colangelo stuff, Drake Pusha T, Roseanne Barr. Basically, a lot of stuff's happening. Yeah, that Colangelo thing was hilarious. I know, yeah. but I like that how the mo- you're like, have you guys been on, on social, social media? media? Like, I went to a lodge. <laughs> I've been hanging at J.R. Diggs at a lodge at Long Point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the big news. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a, a weird situation because originally I went up uh, last Thursday, and this was our big trip with the baby. It was going to be our first overnight trip. And that's, you know, for a 12-day-old, that's a big deal. So we're taking... She's, she's thinking, I can't believe I'm doing this overnight. <laughs> <Just> anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> what are they well, thinking? I'm not ready. You know, there's bugs up there. It could yeah, be of course. Hot. Like, how do we regulate the baby's temperature? Because babies can't regulate their own uh, temperature at this, this point. So it is it is kind of risky, but we're trying to be like cool parents. We're like, <laughs> Putting the baby at risk. fuck it. Let's risk the baby's life. You know? <laughs> but it, it is, it's such like, I know I was saying parenting is easy and all that, but it's such a fucking hassle to get the baby out of the house. You're like changing it into a million outfits. Then you get it in the outfit. Then it shits its pants. <laughs> then you get it in a new outfit. Then it shits its pants again. <laughs> then you have to go to the washroom. Then, you know, it's like this, it, it took us three hours to get ready. We, the kid hates the car seat. It never wants to be in it. Unless the car seat's in motion, it just will go ape. We Finally, we get it in our car seat. We get up to JR's uh, lodge. It's about an hour and a half drive. And, you know, we're playing like we have this uh, good uh, Beatles lullaby album. So it plays all the classic Beatles songs just with like xylophones, lullaby. And the kid loves Hey Jude. Oh, uh, so that's anytime she starts crying, we'll just literally switch it to Hey Jude and she'll just be quiet. So things are going fairly smooth. Get up to the lodge, beautiful day. And Jared's Lodge, I've never been there, I've only seen it on Instagram. It's actually really awesome. Like it's way better than JR even makes it seem. Yeah, I can I can attest to that because I was just there the previous week and it is awesome. Because he never shows too that the beach is literally right across from his lodge. He always makes it seem like it's way further away for some reason. Like he's got a show. Like, hey, I'm here and the beach is there. Yeah, well, I feel like when people say it's like it's right near the beach, like in your mind, you're like, okay, it's probably like a. 20 minute walk to the beach but it's like literally 50 feet from the beach yeah and jr's like you know he's not a shyster but he's kind of like a, a salesman so you're like okay he's exaggerating how good this is but he's actually under selling how good it yeah. is. yeah anyway we're there for like i don't know two two hours and uh as you guys know uh i own another property with my wife and that tenant is moving out okay these are adult problems man they are and with my wife giving birth and everything, it's been very hard to find time to go show the house to new tenants and people who are interested in. And when they are interested, it's been very hard to keep on top of it and reminding them when to show up. Because a lot of people will flake out unless you're s- confirming the date that they're supposed to show up to look at the house, yada, yada, yada. So we get up there and we get a text from a woman and she says, I saw your ad. I have two disabled children. My husband died recently, and I really need a place. And I don't want you to think I'm a sketch bag based on this information. I know there's a stigma around people who get uh, disability checks, but that's not me. And we're like, cha-ching. Like, this chick is desperate, right? (laughs) She she needs a place. And we're trying to get this place uh, rented before June 1st. Otherwise, you kind of take a bath on the month. So we're just sitting there and we're like, Jer, we're going to have to leave the lodge and go show the, this house back in Hamilton. Because 
you know, new baby, we need the money. So <laughs> yeah. he's he's like, dude, dude, what what are you doing? This is a beautiful day. Like he's like, you know, and he rearranged his time a little bit to to be with us. Even though I said, you know, you don't have to do that because you know we, we can handle ourselves and don't feel any pressure to be like good host. But Jr. always does that. He always goes above and beyond to be like the the perfect host. Anyways, we bail on Jr. to go back to Hamilton in the air conditioner breaks in our car oh, as no. oh no there's no amount of hey jude that can probably make up for that no so the baby's going nuts and presumably dying at this point because it's been like half an hour i don't know what to do she's going on she's crying we put down all the windows in the car so it, it gets somewhat cool when you're going on a highway doing like 80 you know in the the, all the winds blowing in but it, it's crazy and like her uh she has like a protective sun cover that's just flapping like nuts and it's it's a scene out of like a horror film it, it's it's very scary it's one of those moments where you're like i should have never gotten married <laughs> oh my God. i should have like i shouldn't have had a kid i shouldn't have done anything it's things Honestly. would be so much easier if it was just me and like, jr I'm, crushing beers at the lodge right i'm not kidding it's oh like, exactly it's like out of a, a move one of those movies where it's trying to show how like hard parenting is and it's like almost cliche how rough it was okay. and i'm really thinking about the pod and like karma and how i shouldn't have said all that, that <laughs> yeah, stuff. last week you're like it's so easy <laughs> i know but still, I still maintain easier than the commute. And then, uh, so we get there to the house, and the the woman doesn't show up. She's like, you know, five minutes late. So we're like, oh, that's weird. We call her. She doesn't answer the phone. Just goes to voicemail every time. Call her again. Answers. And then Alex is like, hey, are you showing up? The woman's like, oh, 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 uh I had an emergency. And she's clearly like playing jazz on the spot, like making shit up. Oh, wow. And then Alex is like, oh, okay. Did you want to reschedule? And then the woman just hangs up. Uh, Whoa. And, you know, it's like anytime someone says they're not something, they always are that thing, right? Like, I, I don't mean to be racist, but yada, yeah, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like, I, I'm not a sketch bag, but and then you can never rely on them. Yeah, right. So we, we fell for the trap because mm. we're just naive people. And then I'm like, give me that phone. I'm going to, like, feed it to this woman. <laughs> but I'm also going to a offer her another time to show up. Because <laughs> you the need money. the renter so bad. You want to take that bath. <laughs> so I get the phone, and she just hangs, does the thing where it goes straight to voicemail on, like, first ring, which is the number one sign that a person's hitting that button. Yeah. Like, just ignore it the respectful way. Just let it keep ringing. <laughs> so I'm furious, obviously. And then I'm like, we have to go back to the long point lodge now like i we've ruined this whole day we, we did all this stuff we have to go back to the lodge so we plan to go back on tuesday of the following week but we we need another car right because our car is screwed up with the air conditioning and stuff we don't want to kill the child mm -hmm. but then uh you know i was in like kind of an awkward situation because the the podcast from last week was released on friday oh yeah and that one like you know was I, I haven't been editing these pods while I've been on paternity leave. Mike has. So when I get them, um, it's always interesting to hear it for the first time after it's been edited. You kind of become uh, used to it when you're, you're doing all the editing for it. But I was really... Um, <laughs> I was really shocked with the last one. And like even by my standards, when it gets to the nipple sucking, I was like cringing in a good way. I was like, oh, this is like really uh, captivating radio, but it is kind of like really embarrassing and cringeworthy and in a fascinating way. I, I did ultimately like it. And, and, and for our listeners, I, you obviously heard it before it went live. Yes, I did. But I made that decision. You know, you make a decision and you pull the shoot and then you're just like, now it's up to the public. And I just really <laughs> A, a baby birthing video which was on that same kind of line and then the nipple sucking things kind of might be considered poor taste <laughs> so, well it was the only time where i'm like jane's gone too far but i still want to do it <laughs> and then but i had this like horrible anxiety about alex's parents listening to it <laughs> because my in-laws my in-laws are like the best as you guys know they're like the nicest people most accepting people the, they really love the uh, birthing episode mm -hmm. but i think this is kind of a line further than that it's not really like the natural thing to be like drinking milk from your wife's nipple so i was like oh, i don't know how they're <laughs> going to yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you're also this. you're also taking food from your child that's true 
Exactly. Yeah, so it's bad on a couple of counts. And then, you know, uh, <laughs> John and Lorna, they saw the birthing video, and then they, they ended up get, get, giving me this, like, crazy gift to replace the Cobra cam. They got me this GoPro Hero 6, which oh, is, like, whoa. a very expensive cam. They're like, you know, make this make these good family videos with this camera. And I was like, holy so shit. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I still will use the Cobra cam for podcast stuff, but for family videos, I will use this new amazing camera. And I think I've been in my in-laws good books for a pretty good period, even though, you know, sometimes I do crazy antics overall, they're very accepting of it, but I was unsure how this was going to fly. And then I get a message from John Uh-oh. on Friday, on Friday. Oh, geez. And he's like, he's like, uh, Hey Shane, just making sure that you're on this week's episode. I'm like, that's weird. But I, I'm John is kind of, he's smart. And sometimes he, if he's being nice, I feel like he knows more than he's acting. Like he might just be like <laughs> testing me to see if I'm going to lie. And I'm like, yes, of course. <laughs> Trying to be confident in the episode. <laughs> oh, and then he goes, oh, because uh, Lorna said that uh, she saw a picture of Dan on Instagram, and maybe you weren't in this episode. Because you guys put up a photo of the three of you out saying New Pod Friday, and it seemed like Dan had replaced me. Oh. Uh, See, and t- I didn't think about it in those terms until everybody started making jokes about how Dan was so much better looking than you. Yeah, those were jokes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were from the Champagne Boys mostly. Okay. Okay, good. Like you said, they were in the comments is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's like, okay, Shane, I'm just going to fire this up in the backyard. Oh, no. Oh, man. Like, he's going to play it over the speakers. And he has, like, he lives in a very good neighborhood, and it's a very nice backyard, and there's always neighbors there. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And we, now that we have a child, we're always having family dinners over at their place. So I am, I'm always interacting with them. So I, I couldn't really, like, hide if this went bad. And then uh, he goes, oh, Shane, we had to shut the pot off. He goes, there was too much swearing. So we didn't we didn't get to your part yet. Uh, I'm like, oh, wow. I'm like swearing. I guess Mike and Max are in, in hot water. <laughs> and then I just don't hear from John again. So I'm like, oh, shit. You, you know, like, and I have a dinner coming up where I'm going to be at their place. And that's the next time I'm going to see John. And then we go there, and then John doesn't really look like, like, usually he gives me a hug and we like embrace, but he didn't do that this time. Like, okay. maybe it was just like the timing wasn't right. And I'm like, ah, I'm feeling really awkward. And I sit down, and then John's like, uh, he's like, hey, yeah, I heard the pot. <sighs> and uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, it was a lot of people's favorite episode, actually. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people said it was their favorite, you know, like even Justin Stockman. And I was like, he said it was his favorite. I was like, Webby, Webmaster Dan, he said it was his favorite. And uh, I'm just exaggerating on how good this is. He goes, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, it was was good. Uh, Lorna couldn't listen to it. She was at the last minute was too much for her. You know, she was she was really cringing. And I'm just like, oh, like I just felt so bad you know and i need to borrow their car also <laughs> <to go up. laughs> jr's long point cottage <laughs> yeah and i've been doing so good with the in-laws like uh the other week john he he works in medical supplies and there was a medical emergency where someone's life was actually on the line but john was up at his cottage so i had to actually get this medical equipment and send it to toronto and like take pictures and do all this stuff and john was like wow great job i owe you one and then this happened and kind of knocked me down a notch. So I'm like really on thin ice with the in-laws. So I'm trying to like be best behavior, be very polite, all that. We end up borrowing their car, which has great air conditioning. <laughs> we go to Long Point Lodge on Tuesday with John's car. You know, John's still being nice. And then John's like, oh, I forgot my wallet in the car. Oh, man. I know where this is going. <laughs> He's like, how how far is it up there? He goes, I'm gonna come up there right now. And we're like, oh, it's a it's an hour and a half. And he's like, oh, okay, you know. And now, like, it's kind of annoying for for John. Like, he's done all this, and it's kind of scary when a really nice guy is getting a little bit frustrated. And I never want to make a really nice guy get mad because that's actually scarier than a guy who's always flying up the handle. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, you know, we'll we'll come to you. We'll we'll meet you in Port Dover. I'm like telling Alex like all these ways, like fuck it, we'll, we've done this before. We'll just drive back. We'll just go back home and give him his wallet. She's like, no, no. And then John's like, 
I'm going to change my flight because he, he, he needed his wallet, but now he's changing his flight to go fly out to some medical conference or something. Wow. And he's like, Shane, could you just go get my wallet and take a picture of my credit card and send it to me? And I'm like, no problem, John. And then I go to my uh, phone to take a picture. And I'm just like panicking. I'm really nervous even to take this picture. I'm like, oh, no, my photos are full. My photos are full. What the fuck do I do? And I'm freaking out because, you know, you have a kid, you take so many photos is that your, your iPhone's always full. So I'm like, oh, what I do is I switch it over to uh, Instagram story take the picture, screen grab it, and then that's a way to kind of get around the photos being full. Because mm-hmm. when you screen grab an Instagram photo, it will go into your photos. So I go, I send that to John, the photo. He's like, great, perfect. I'll come there tomorrow morning and uh, and pick it up. And we're like, no, John, we're going to wake up early and send it to you. We're going to we're gonna drive to you tomorrow morning. He's like, oh, that's amazing. I go, uh, the baby's crying now. I go to change the baby's diaper, but I sit on my phone when I change the diaper and it Instagrams John's work credit card number. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't realize it, obviously. And then Mike's like, is that a prank? He sends me a text. Basically, Danica had messaged me with a screen grab of it. And she goes, did Shane mean to do this? Because she knew, obviously, it was your father-in-law. And I, I looked and I went, it's got to be a bit. I don't know. I'm like, but I'll message him right away. I'm like, I don't really know what he's doing, but there must be a follow-up Insta. And then I texted you immediately. See, see this is the problem because I've been getting so outrageous lately that it would seem like a prank I would do to like put someone's credit card number out there to like fuck with people now. Or like a setup or something. I just, I gave you the yeah. benefit of the doubt, but I still messaged you because I was like, this probably shouldn't be on our Insta story. And like, John doesn't know this, but if he's listening right now, know that it was up for like maybe a minute. Yeah, 15 minutes. I deleted it <laughs> off of the Insta story. So I don't think any weird charges, like our fans are pretty good. There's a lot of like very kind women who follow us who I don't think would be like fraudsters. Right. Yeah. That's fine, right? I think it's fine. And to put John's mind at ease, and if you're listening, John, thank you for listening. I hope last week's episode didn't put you off of being a regular listener. And I'm not going to keep pushing the limits. You know, that was... Like, that was an isolated thing, and I'm not always going to be trying to make it extreme. I always want to make it interesting in different ways, but I don't want to get so crazy where everyone's uncomfortable. Yeah, and to put John's mind at ease, if someone were to screen grab that Insta story, we would have got a notification. That's right. Wait, you get notifications if you screen grab someone's Insta story? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Uh, like Shaney Boy said, he's trying to rent a place in Hamilton. So if you're a listener and you're in the Hamilton area and you want to rent a place and you're not going to be shady and you're going to show up to see it, reach out to him at ShaneyBoy69 on Instagram. Yeah, DM, DM him. Yeah, that's how he's doing it these days, I Turn guess. Turn a real estate site. <laughs> uh, a huge thank you to Jenna Gregory and Tara Paquette for putting together the artwork. You can find us on the internet at Mike on Much for Twitter and Instagram. Once again, uh, subscribe to the podcast. It really makes a big difference. And uh, tell your friends. The Michael Much Podcast is produced by Max Kerman. I'm your host, Mike Veerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend.